we're covering chapter four, which is on the data set, which is going to be the thread of the rest of the book, um, which is Hames housing. It's quite a short chapter, so I just had a bit of play with exploring data analysis to bring the points home instead. Um, learning objectives are to showcase that exploring data analysis is important. We're talking about the aim housing data, the context, what, what's in there, um, and the specific aim housing data, which is used in tidy models because it's not the actual original one. Um, and then in particular, related to exploring data analysis, the log transformation and why it makes sense sometimes. Um, so I'll start with aims of housing data. I've, um, I didn't walk through any kind of book done, but I, I've done a markdown file. Um, so I couldn't actually install the tidy models. That was a really bad start. Um, so I've been working with the aims housing data, the original one, uh, which I've done some work on in December. Um, so I'll give you the background of this one and then move on to the differences with in the tidy model as per the chapter. AIMS housing um, is housing data, it's very explicit in the name, from AIMS, which is in Iowa, um, and home to Iowa State University, for those like me who don't know where that is. Um, it was developed by the in 2011 as a resource for teaching. That's why I know it, because it was used in when I was taught on the regression. And um, in the markdown, I've put some links to the documentation and an article is what participated in the project. The original data set has 82 variables and the new one has 74. And because I can't load the tidy model version, I'm not really sure what's been dropped. Uh, I'm just quite curious if anyone knows actually, I'd be really glad to know. Um, there's a lot of categorical slash nominal variables in there. I'll show you a, a bit the list. Some mountain ones, some discrete, and some continuous ones. In the tidy model book, the continuous one, which would be the outcome of interest, is the sale price, uh, but that doesn't have to be the only thing. When I worked on it, we were working on the lot area and what predicts the the area of a of a housing lot lot um, instead. There's about three thousand observation, close to three thousand observation. The main difference in my understanding between the original one in Ames housing and tidy model is that one tidy model has factored everything, but I'm actually not sure that's pretty true because in Ames housing it's I think it's already pre-factored. We factored what needs to be factored, so categorical variables. Um, in, am I supposed to start the recording or is it automatic? Sorry, it's automatic. Thanks, <laughs> glad to know. Uh, and so, this, the other key difference is also um, that in the original data set. If a feature like, you know, does the uh, house has a porch or whatever I'm making this up right now. The example in the chapter is Ali. If a house, if we have missing data, we don't know if it's because the, the feature is not there explicitly or it's just missing data and they change that. Um, so I'm not really sure how that works. Um, I guess it just replaced missing data by it doesn't have the feature. Actually, I'm still confused a bit by how that works. Um, like I said, I'm not really sure the factoring of all categorical variables is truly new. In terms of, sorry, I don't know why my screen is. Um, in terms of variables, there's a lot, but here's some example. Um, of categorical ones, which could be used to predict uh, sale price, you know, that type of streets, does it have a nanny? Uh, the shape, I guess, is important because it's harder to build extensions or whatever. Um, there's a bunch of stuff which 
we need to be explored um, to be understood fully. But you know, the, um, in terms of continuous predictors, for example, which are interesting is uh, the kitchen area, um, the bedroom areas, the size of key rooms, um, and things like this. There's a, a lot of variables. I'm not going to go over them one by one. There is actually a porch one. I wasn't on. <laughs> didn't do it on purpose. It's a type of porch. So is it enclosed or open or a screen? I'm clearly not a real estate person. So I don't fully really understand all of this. Um, I'm sorry for the display of my markdown. I don't know why it's doing this. So moving on to exploring data analysis and um, why it's important. I, I'll go back to chapter first, actually. Um, so I think it's more interesting first. So they, they did that really interesting exploratory data analysis of um, mapping so look, the neighborhoods on, on an actual map to identify you know, key potential issues where maybe there's a mistake in the neighborhood um, attribute given to some um, observations, sorry. And so that's one really important key of exploratory data analysis is to understand you know, why, if there is there any error in the data, which would be obviously an error, maybe you find a, a value which is impossible if you're working with a scale, uh, which is a type of data I'm working with. So if I'm measuring a trait and, and the trait is only measured until up to, from one to 10 and it, there is an answer which is 12, obviously there is a mistake. And that's what they've done with, done with the mapping, which I think is really interesting. Um, <coughs> so that's, I think, a really nice demonstration of why you need exploratory data analysis. And then the other reason is to, to observe the distribution of the continuous files, that's where we go to um, the need to use log transformation. So that's when I had a little bit of a play. Uh, I've, because I worked with the lot area, I've, I've done it too, uh, because I know the lot area is also quite uh, skewed. So I've done both. Here's um, the lot area distribution. It's clearly uh, wide skewed. There's some really massive houses there. Uh, skewing the distribution, massive plots, sorry, not houses. And if you look at the price and the situation, it's massively skewed. Um, shouldn't be logged already, sorry, that's a mistake. Um, and I think where it's even clear, where it's useful, so this is the first thing you see, it's not normally distributed. And um, is my screen showing like this to you? It's yeah. really weird. Sorry. Yeah, well, it I, is. OK, it's better now. Smaller, but better. I wonder if you, if you render it in the browser, if it'll be. Uh, yeah, I could point. Thanks. I don't know. That is a very good point. Let me find it. Yeah. I think you just click open right, right up there on the top. Oh, yes. That is just. Uh, no, I take Chrome Sans. Yeah, definitely. See, clearly, never do that. Um, today I learned. So, um, so obviously, yes, it's not only distributed, which has, uh, if you're working with um, specific, you know, statistics you want to do and, and some frequency tests, for example, you need to meet the assumption of normality. So that's already an issue in itself. If you do a, a, some modeling, you need to know that the data is uh, following the normal Gaussian distribution. You know, you can apply this family of uh, regression. So that's already some information there. But also, if you don't log it, then the, the relationship is quite difficult to interpret and even visually. So that's where I started making up some graphs. So the relation between lot area and cell price, if I don't log the data, or well, only can half of it clearly. Because, yeah. I have a quick question, please. Right. So, um, in the book they use, and um, this is a very dumb question, I believe, um, 
they use um, uh, to take the log of the data log 10. So um, why um, using log 10? Um, because I, uh, in R4 data science in modeling chapter, they use, um, hardly use log base two. And here is base 10. Um, what is the difference between choosing the base 10 or base two? What informed us to do one or either of the two? So I don't think it's a dumb question because I didn't think about wondering about this. So because I've been trained to think about log 10 only transformation. And so the fact that you're asking it is way further. You see, like I've been trained so much on this that I, I'm not even wondering. So I'm curious if anyone knows, because I don't. And if not, I'll search it. Yeah, my, my understanding is that just um, you just want to choose the transformation that kind of gets your data to be more uh, normal, yeah. I guess. No, like no. More, more uh, like they talk about the variance being stabilized. Um, yeah, so I think just in different circumstances, the transformation that does that is going to be vary based on how skewed it is. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, but, so when, when I was trying to initially in, in psych we were trying to transform mostly square root inverse and log but then the log was always 10 and and that which one you were applying was definitely based on which one is going to give you a normal distribution so right. it, it's quite exploratory as far as i understand right um so um, um uh the kevin made a comment and i think um uh, i also read about the book where they said a logarithmic transform may also uh, stabilize the variance in a way that makes inference more legitimate. So I don't really understand this sentence that uh, the logarithm transform stabilize the variance in a way that makes the inference more legitimate. What does this really mean? My very idiosyncratic take on this would be that I, I this world of stabilizing is um, a bit confusing for me as well because I've never heard of that. But I would say it's, it's, the, the variance become more even because it's normalized, and and in that sense, then it's more legitimate because it can be used in tests which require normal distribution. So that's a very idiosyncratic interpretation. Anyone has a additional converse opinion. Yeah, I'm looking up the definition right now and it, it it's very circular. It says uh, <laughs> very stabilizing transformation is, is chosen to either simplify considerations in graph, graphical exploratory analysis or allow the application of simple regression based analysis analysis of variance techniques. Um, so I think I think that's just basically saying that you it's like transformation to to um, satisfy the assumptions of the of the modeling choice that you're using. Um, mm. But I need to look more into the re, to really understand what they mean by variance stabilizing. Uh, there's probably a, a better explanation somewhere. But, um, All right, thank you. Anything else? So in terms of interpretation, which is also one of the key points of using the log transform, for example. So as an aside, talking about you know why do we use the log to log 10? When, when I had that class uh, on regression last term, I did specifically ask, uh, because my lecturer was never talking about anything on log transformation. And like I said, in psych, we have square root transformation and inverse. And, and I was just really surprised. And she never really replied. She just sent me to something on why do we transform and not really why, you know, is there so many different transformations. So it seems that in the statisticians world, there's just log transforms. Why in the psychology world, for some reason, uh, I've been taught stuff which maybe are not we're not supposed to do. Um, so why would you apply a, a log transform on top of normalizing the data? It's also in terms of interpretation. 
So if I show you this graph, which has only half um, transform, which shouldn't have been the case, I wanted to do it on non-transform fully. Um, it's quite hard to see any relationship here um, between you know the plot area and cell price, but then the minute I transform, it's tada, it's here. You can quite see a, a trend, and it's it's much easier to interpret for the formal the mortal like me basically. And um, I'm sorry, this is super fast, but this is. all on log transformation. In terms of exploit data um, analysis, I'm, my, maybe I'm jumping the gun as well, but for me, a lot of exploit data analysis in modeling is exploring the relationship. And the, it's, it's mentioned in the book quite briefly, you know, exploring the relationships in terms of checking that some variables are not related. So since I had played with the data set before and in particular, lot area, I, I wanted to look at the relationship between lot area as a predictor and other potential predictors uh, that I knew were related. So I just wanted to show you that. So um, I don't think, for example, we, we have an issue having zoning classification, uh, which is a type of neighborhood um, being related to lot area, um, but if you look at the ground living area of the house, it's it's quite related to lot area. So this is something also very useful to learn from exploring data analysis because if you put both variables in the in the model, um, it's just havoc. Uh, that's one of the other things I don't fully understand. I just know that if it's too related, you just can't interpret the model fully. Uh, and similarly, this is a factor variable car carriage, car capacity, and lot area seems to be a trend as well of relationship. So those are things which are really useful from exploring data analysis and why you should do it. I told you it would be a short chapter. It is a short chapter. You've read it. Anyone wants to add anything? I wonder where there's a floating village in Ames, Iowa. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there's quite a few houses there too. Yeah, I, I, like, I there's no water in Iowa. <laughs> I don't know, you, you tell me, you're, you're closer to it than me. Um, in the in that zoning zoning classification, my graph has uh, dropped the industrial and agricultural classifications as well, just because that's what we were asked to do, and and that makes sense. You don't really have you know houses in which you live in industrial and agricultural classification. Um, I think we. We'll, sorry, I'm just going to change the code. We dropped another one. I can't remember which one right now. Um, so the A is agricultural, or maybe C is commercial. So those are the zoning areas which are strictly for residential housing, as far as I understand it. And yeah, floating village that you see, I didn't know there was no water. <laughs> I'm just Googling up. I have to Google, sorry. It's a good question. So retirement community, maybe. <laughs> it's a bunch of people doing exploratory data analysis, but no real explanation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I didn't, um, but actually you can see that's really dead things like, you really need more time than I spent on it in terms of exploring such a data file that you have no idea about from the beginning. And I think it's it's really also showing the importance of domain expertise. It's like mm. I'm going to model this stuff, but I actually have no clue about yeah, housing what, in general. What does that thing say about like it being a retirement community? The one you clicked on.
So no, I'm assuming. Okay, special area where retirement community was developed and have the highest median price. Hmm. Hmm. This is like retirement but, communities. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And it's interesting because if you look at the graph, if I can turn it back. In terms of uh, lot area, it's actually hmm, I mean, it's, it's so it's more expensive, uh, but it's actually not larger, which makes sense for a retirement community, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they're mostly paying to be close to healthcare resources. Interesting. Um, can I just make a very Yoda like comment? So, um, one of the reasons, and they don't say this explicitly in the book, but one of the reasons why I feel exploratory data analysis is important is so that you, you can go through the process that we are going through right now. So, you see if there's anything in there that's surprising or unexpected. And it also gives you a little bit of a feel for what's going on so that when you actually model the stuff, you know whether your models actually make sense. Yeah. yeah. And that is the excellence of in EDA, right? Um, but also, no, I agree. Um, um, you know, it's like, if you don't have the domain expertise and the time, you probably, and even in the time, it's having different pairs of eyes to see different things. It's data is really useful, I think, because like, I might look at it and see something, which you're, you're gonna see something else. Yeah, a quick question, please. Um, I don't know, Um, there is a kind of spatial information, spatial information of the data in the chapter um, uh, for the neighborhood. Uh, I didn't see the code. How can some, how can I um, re implement the, that stuff? I don't know. The maps? Yeah, the map. Yeah, I, I was the same. I was like, give me the code, man. And I had the same frustration. I was like, I want to see the code. But I, I think it would be nice. <laughs> Um, to, um, to I don't know, to include the code so that maybe someone can learn as well, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know the reason why they exclude it. I agree. Because if the code is not included and the, 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 the math can also be just excluded. Ah, okay. This is a code for, oh, okay. Oh, thanks. Yeah, the thanks, whole Kevin. book. Sure. Uh, the whole book is open source, uh, but it does kind of look like they inserted an image that was pre-made uh, somewhere else in those mm. cases, uh, from what I can tell in the markdown. Um, so yeah, they have a folder called pre-made. Uh, so I believe that that's there, but maybe you can, if you look through that, you can see where those pre-made images are coming from. Um, it, I, I would guess it's all there somewhere, but just have to look through it. Uh, it's not, it's definitely not from the, the article presenting the data set. So. Mm -hmm. Just about checked. Yeah. So I have another quick question. Um, so um, in, at the last part of the book, he made, mentioned that some questions to ask while doing EDA. One of the things I don't understand, what is pathological distribution? Wait. Um, he asked about pathological distributions. Um, so I don't really understand. Uh, oh, well, uh, I think anything skewed or, yeah. you know, or even anything non-normal. I mean, not non-normal because I was going to say bimodal, but you, you, you can work with bimodal, uh, probably. I think because you could you could have a non-normality by having skewness, but also by having um, kurtosis so when it's really flat or really picky. 
that the way I've been taught start is something also to pay attention to. I'm not completely convinced anymore because the way I'm currently taught start is mostly about skewness. Okay. <laughs> See if we can find a, a Cauchy distribution. But it's pathological because it's undefined, basically. Undefined, what, um, um Kochi? Hmm. In Kochi case, yeah. And that, you, you also sent me to another Google <laughs> Kochi, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't, don't know what is Kochi, but let me see, it. it's shared, okay, right. If you click on the pathological link, uh, it's a more general definition. It says pathological uh, object is one which possesses possesses deviant, irregular, or counterintuitive properties. Ah, okay. So the one that is not um, does not possess any um, uh, uh, shape or some I don't know and no any pattern, right? Maybe. Yeah, well, it says like distinguishes from what distinguishes it from what is conceived as a typical object in the same category. So I think if you, in the case of Cauchy, um, the the variance is infinite, right, uh, or it's undefined, um, which is which is different uh, than a lot of other distributions, which where the variance is defined. Um, so. I think that's what they mean. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a broad term because it's going to depend on what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to do regression um, and it's linear, well, you know, mostly you should be working with Gaussian, although that's not completely true. Um, so it's pathological if it's not Gaussian, I guess. The minute it deviates from what you need it to be for the model you want, it's pathological, I guess. but that depends on what you're trying to do. All right, thank you. Yes, okay. Anything else, anyone? Just going back to the chat. Um, I have mm. another quick question. Um, if you can open the book as well. Yeah, it's here. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, right. So um, uh, this, um, the second point here, are there high correlation between predictors? So what does this imply if we have high correlation between predictors? What does that tell us? It, uh, it, the problem with high correlation between predictor, which is also called multicollinearity, is that um, then you can't really understand the model. And it's, it's just because both predictors are both going to predict the outcome and there's some redundancy. So the mass behind it and the stuff I don't really understand. I just you know that's actually an assumption. You, know, you don't want that. You don't want to be to have this overlap between predictors, otherwise you can't make anything of your model. So if you have this, that implies you should get rid of one and you should select your variables based on your predictors, sorry, based on this. There is another option. That's my, again, my what, own. What you can also do is you can um, is you can turn them into a factor. 
So uh, rather than um, getting rid of an individual and losing some variance, because there will be inevitably be a little bit of variance in each of the each of the levels, you can put them together into one factor instead. So if you had four items that were loading onto each other with similar level distributions or correlations, then you can just throw those together, basically. Yeah, you mean you mean like. A making a, a score like some items on the scale would make a, a score a bit um, like a you know about psychometric measures yeah yeah that's what i yeah do. yeah so if you if you build a psychometric measure like a tele, like a measure of intelligence or personality mm. you've got various different um scales as it were um so for instance in introversion extroversion on a uh, o, uh ocean personality test we have 10 questions the reason yeah. why we have 10 questions is because, oh, sorry if I'm teaching to suck eggs, but this is for the others. Um, the reason why you have 10 questions is because you can't use one question to ask about a cognitive structure. It's stupid to do so. Uh, just like that, what is it that I really hate? Um, ah, net promoter score, worst measure I've ever seen in my life. Um, but the point is it measures like zero, one to 10, it's stupid. But the, because there is variance within each, um, in each metric that loads onto the same cognitive, uh, sorry, the same structure, we, because they highly correlated, we can throw them all together and that reduces down the amount of error in the response. So what we might say is, oh, if we have like say three different measures of, um, of say for instance, wealth, and throw them all in together. Well, they might all basically be highly correlated and it might be useful to just get rid of one of the, one or two of them. But then at the same time, we might be lo losing some information. So if we aggregate them together instead, then we get a much more powerful measure. Yeah, so with the housing data, you probably could do, because the ones which are going to be highly correlated, I suspect, and uh, if you look at the area ones, so you know, the kitchen area and the, the living room area are obviously going to, going to be correct, correlated to the overall area of the house or the above ground, sorry, the above ground living area. So you could, you wouldn't make a composite score out of above ground living area plus kitchen plus bedroom, but you could take each room to make that composite score instead and not choose above ground because I think that would be redundant. Um, yeah, you could do basically psychometric supply to real estate in a way with this and make um, take them in and make a composite, a composite score. And also, yes, that's a really good point because that's better than dropping data. I think the, the issue is more if you have to correlated variables and I don't know if they're really like meaning the same you have to decide to drop in one like you know again if I take kitchen area and above one living area they're related because generally the more you have a, an area above ground living the bigger the likely the more likely the kitchen is to be large and I think making composite score wouldn't make sense. And um, that's where the judgment starts to be in as well as part of, part of the thing that I don't really like is stats. I would, right. I would say that a lot of exploratory data analysis, um, and it's not it doesn't really go across this in the, uh, in the book so much, but a lot of exploratory data analysis is kind of like you learning about the data and getting used to it. And, you know, if you're an expert in your background, in your particular field, like, so obviously if you're psychology, you probably know the theory quite well. So it's easier to make uh, suppositions about um, what particular metrics are doing what and how they interlink. However, if you're not an expert in a particular field and you're, you know, uh, there's a lot of data scientists, we're forced to interact with data that perhaps isn't something that we're used to. So going through the process of meticulously in looking through the data and trying to find out what that means can be a really powerful tool for helping you to later understand it when it comes to what kind of an analysis should I apply to this as opposed to as on top of the is this data clean does it relate right because sometimes you can create the cleanest the cleanest data structure in the world 
but you'll actually lose a lot of information just by following best data practices if you don't know what you're doing with the actual uh, with the actual data that's going into it. No, I agree. Also, I personally, I I think even spending a lot of time if I don't know the domain, I wouldn't be comfortable making decisions. I don't like making those judgments on you know things which are quite vague. Like, is it correlated? Is it strongly correlated? And um, um, yes. I think domain experts is super important and, and you can be a, a data science wizard if you don't have a, a, an expert to bounce your idea. You, you, you know, if, if the expert is not a data scientist, well, the, you still need to talk to them and check with them that it makes sense, your understanding after the, the exploratory data, data analysis, I think. I wouldn't be comfortable making decisions on Three-day state data. Yeah, to build on that point too, I I, um, I often find that uh, a lot of the times on my job, uh, I'm looking at data that hasn't really been looked at, uh, kind of on a large scale before. Um, and when I'm doing exploratory data analysis, I also find I'll often find other issues that are need to be addressed through some other project um, that aren't related to what I'm trying to do, you know, cause like it just hasn't been unearthed in this way before, you know? So, so I'm like, Oh, the, you know, it seems like this thing's not working properly, you know? So, um, I don't know. That's also another outcome. That's like, it's not related at all to the project I'm doing, but that process unearths a lot of different things. Um, so just one other angle to that. Um, so I have another quick question, please. Um, yeah, so it still relates to, to the last point where he made mention, um, when you are doing EDA, you need to check are there association between predicted and outcomes. So how can I find, uh, make, uh, know that there is association and what is the negative effect if there is any, uh, what will happen if there is association between the two? And how can I deal with the situation if I have these associations? So checking, um, I start visually and you can look at the correlation value. There is, I mean, like when I was being taught last term, I was trying to get, you know, in psychology again, we, we have kind of thresholds, but my, my statistician stats lecturer don't seem, don't seem to think thresholds are are there and it's true that they're probably a bit too blunt, you know. Um, I think that goes back to what August was saying and what we were saying about domain expertise, you know. So the thresholds on their own are probably not the only information you should look at. Like, is it strongly correlated? Is it surprising, etc.? Um, then how do you deal with it is what August was suggesting. Um, if you can avoid to throw to not choose the variable. You could make a composite score if it makes sense. So um, the example where I teach students about composite score is imagine I'm trying to, to work with um, intention to leave your job. And so instead of asking, do you plan to leave your job? You, you generally don't ask that. You, you ask people if they're happy. So it's like, you can ask them if they're looking for the job. You can ask them, um, if uh, they're planning to develop their career in the company. And so those two questions are indirect ways of measuring, looking for your job, looking for other jobs, sorry. So from this, you can build a, a composite score of intention to leave. And so you, instead of throwing the two variables because they are going to be correlated, you just make a third one and you use that third one as a, as a predictor instead. Does that help? Yeah. You can say no, that's okay. Yeah, see if you have, exactly. I think it's um, the things that are discussed in the chapter next week, possibly, spending your, your data 
you know, deciding which predictors to use part, is part of any near data. But I'm not completely sure. So I'm reading what Carlo has posted. Oh, that's nice. Thanks, Carlo. Yeah, so it's like you almost don't need a second variable. I mean, especially in the extreme case, because they're so correlated, they're the same. Yeah, that link I shared earlier talks about multicollinearity too, and how um, if you have that in the case of regression, um, small changes in the model or the data, I guess, can lead to um, large swings in the values of the coefficients. So it becomes kind of unstable. Uh, and um, yeah, and the, the, the you've, I think some cases with pretty bad bad errors. Um, because uh, the regression is assuming that they're independent and identically distributed. Um, yeah, the predictor shouldn't be correlated. That's definitely uh, an assumption of it. And I'm actually checking a bit. But I think that also, it also depends, I think, on what your, um, what kind of approach you're using to model whatever you're looking at. Because if you're using something like uh, a decision tree or random forest, like it doesn't matter as much in, as far as I know. Um, uh, it doesn't really make any assumptions about the, the shape, the, the kind of the, the shape of your data or the relationships between the variables. I think, I think it'll just, well, it seemed, I think in my, in my experience, it just kind of, learns the proper uh, rules that, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe others have different opinions on that, but it doesn't, it doesn't, in some cases, it doesn't seem like it makes that much of a difference to reduce collinearity. Um, uh, as I achieve regression in modeling, so and in regression is definitely an assumption, but that is the right, that's not to say that it's an assumption in general in modeling. It's an assumption of regression as far as I understand, not necessarily of anything else. So yeah, random forest tricks, yeah, so possibly not. We shall see in the rest of the book. Yeah, I and I think when you start having like thousands or hundreds of predictors, it's kind of hard to do that, that manual, um, uh, like treatment of the predictors. Um, yeah. I mean, you could still do something yeah, like ETA, but, but, uh, but yeah, it, yeah, it comes a little harder to do that. Yeah, that's true. I guess you could like put a correlation matrix still for the continuous predictors, but yeah. Still a lot of information if you have yeah so many predictors to look at. When it doesn't really matter, you can always like remove the ones that at least seem to make the la the least sense in terms of explaining the outcome variable. So if like there's not a logical association between your outcome variable and one of the correlated variables seems like that's a good candidate to just remove it because it's not really adding anything. I wouldn't, what would be a case where you have, are you talking about the two predictors who are correlated or? 
because if they're correlated and one is correlated to the outcome, I assume the other one is as well. Yeah, in that instance, and when you're using a model that doesn't uh, have assumptions about um, the nature of the predictors, like random forests or um, decision trees, mm -hmm. then it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily need to include predictors that are heavily correlated, just pick the ones that have the most explanatory value. Okay. I really don't know about random trees and stuff at the moment, so that's coming later. So that would become clearer, I think, for me. It's part of it. Does anybody have any more questions or are we feeling complete? No, thank you, Emily. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.